Retro Rebel is brought to you by TempleofGeek.com, your one-stop shop for all things geek. You can find all of our episodes and fulfill your sci-fi, fantasy, and geek culture-related needs at TempleofGeek.com. Welcome to the Retro Rebel Gamecast, where we discuss gaming and related topics. Retro Rebel is released Fridays, and you can find this episode and much more by heading to templeofgeek.com or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Retro Rebel Podcast. My name is Stacy, and with me as always is my fellow Rebel co-host, Amanda. Hello. 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 All right. Welcome back to our biannual meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it works great the second time as well so what's been going on <laughs> never not funny <laughs> it's never not funny <laughs> uh yeah listen i know we're going to talk about diablo 4 later so i won't say anything about it right now uh last week i recorded arcade paradise which has the most patronizing father figure in it ever uh watch the videos i think i got audibly upset at one point because i was like how dare you speak to me like this <laughs> you know <laughs> really uh, yeah, your really disappointed father who just goes on about how good for nothing you are and like you're trash and if you don't screw it up. And I was like, calm down. Yeah, like <laughs> you're running a laundromat. How hard could it be? The answer, not hard. OK, so, not hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but you have the opportunity to uh, expand the arcade part of the laundromat that's in the back, sort of providing entertainment for customers. And, you know, it, best part of the laundromat, by the way. Yeah. Of course. So it, it was pretty fun. I did mention multiple times about how I was shocked to be doing other people's laundry because I thought you go to a laundry mat, you do it yourself. That's what the arcade is there for. Like, why would you hang around while I do it for you? So, But then what do you really do? Like, because then you're just doing maintenance on laundry machines. Yeah. Is that what the Laundry machines? Is that is that well? Much? And they have a guest toilet there. There was a few times when I went in there very accusingly, where I, I felt a certain someone was going to shit up my toilet. So uh, just <laughs> uh, you take out the trash because customers be leaving. You customers. profiled yeah. someone about I your did. toilet. I really did. <laughs> Maybe Fair that's enough. the downside of like living above a pub now. I'm just very suspicious of anyone who's in the toilet for too long. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the things I would not have thought were game features. <laughs> of um, course. And the, the bubble gum removal mini game. How exciting. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. 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 So it's, that it's is, special. What about you? That is a whole episode in and of itself is just how mundane of a task can we make into a game? Into it. Yeah, <laughs> there's like a there's like a power bar and everything. They really went. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, no, I so uh, I've been playing. I uh, played a little bit of uh, Diablo Four, which, like we said, we'll discuss that later. Um, I've uh, I also played uh, It Takes Two with. Uh, I did not play with my wife, which was ult- that was the original goal was to play with her, but, uh, I ended up playing with my five-year-old daughter and, um, yeah. And, uh, she had created her own narrative about how this game, cause she can't read. So none of the things that were happening or written on screen were uh, making any sense to her. So she really created her own narrative, which is fantastic and on brand for my children. So, um, that was that was a lot of fun. The gameplay and the mechanics. Uh, I'm not saying it's for children because it it is absolutely not, and the content is probably above her pay grade as well because it is about a divorcing pair, uh, couple. Um, but uh, that said, she was able to pick up a lot of the skills and a lot of the things that um, that uh, that you're asked to do in the game, and so it was enjoyable for both of us. We didn't finish it by any stretch, but we did play it for a few hours. Uh, and so that was good. And then uh, I'm back on the uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, How dare you? Train. I know. <laughs> I fell off the. I fell off the wagon. Um, but I've actually really enjoyed it. There's so much more to do in that game, and I, you know, it's it's up front that you pay monthly for it. So you already know you're in it for you know 15 bucks a month. Uh, and so they're not as egregious about some of the other uh, pay to play mechanics that Blizzard Blizzard has uh, ruined their other games with. So, 
Uh, so it's been fun. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Well, what's been going on in the news? Well, I've got uh, two news stories. The first one two is news. that uh, in September, Games with Gold is finally going to get retired and Xbox is bringing out the new Xbox Game Pass Core, which is just like an enhanced Games with Gold. It costs the same amount of money, except everyone will get access to more than 25 um, Xbox Studio titles like right off the bat, in addition to obviously anything they've gotten in the past. Um, and then they plan to add to this library of core games every month. Then, you, of course, you have the ultimate, which is even more titles, all the EA stuff and the sort of first day access. Um, but I'm excited to see what it's about. I think that Xbox's proposition generally in the subscription space is massive. Um, and now that I have seen both Nintendo store and PlayStation's firsthand, it's a million times better in terms of what what's on offer. So I think it's not negative for anyone. I think they needed to bring it all underneath one banner and it makes sense to have those two tiers so they can separate, you know, the exclusive access and the more prestigious titles from their own in-house stuff. Yeah, no, I'm. I uh, I agree, and and I have all well I don't have a PS5, but I've I've got access to the store, and so the store is similar. There are just some games you can't play on PS4 that are exclusive to PS5, uh, and then I've got the Xbox Series X and and then a Nintendo. It's not it's not a humble brag. Just do have those. <laughs> well, I have a PS5. Well, access yeah. to a PS5 now. It doesn't belong to me, but I have access to a PS5 and the Nintendo Switch Lite. So I'm just I, happy for you. I find so that, that you I know. I, I never thought that I would do it. It looked better than right there. So, <laughs> Well, now you can play The Last of Us. I've, I've finally got one. <laughs> yes. All no, the years. Nintendo. I knew, Now, that was the big – that's the big surprise is the Nintendo. But now you can play The Last of Us, and so I'm excited. For yes, it is on the list of things to do. Although I have to say, I don't know if you find it. Maybe I have very small hands, but the PlayStation 5 controller is not as comfortable as the Xbox controller is. Like It's not. I don't know it's, if you found smaller, that. Yeah. But I really, really, really struggle to consistently push the left button in. Like it's a bit too far out from where how long my thumb is. Is that dumb? Like <laughs> I really struggle with it. No, that's not. It's but it is what it is. And and similarly with the the switch controller, like you have to have the pro controller to really enjoy that the most. So to the full. To really enjoy it. Um, but uh, my bit of news, and, and I, I don't I don't want to, I'm not going to go into detail because I don't know what it means yet, but I know that um, there's been this opposition from PlayStation to uh, this opposition from PlayStation uh, to this merger with Xbox and Blizzard, Activision. And the biggest point of contention is the ability to play some of the games cross-platform, uh, especially Call of Duty. And so PlayStation and Xbox or Microsoft just reached an agreement on Call of, du Call of Duty. And so that is going to be a – and I don't know if that was your other news. That may have been your other news. Yeah, but you know what? That's totally fine because I wanted to talk about it anyway. So oh, well, good. Here's what I think actually happened. So because – um, Microsoft was approved by the like antitrust body or whatever. It was expected that their acquisition was going to go through no matter what. And because they had offered PlayStation a 10 year deal with Call of Duty, which they initially said no to, I think they accept it now because if it goes ahead and they don't have a deal in place, it's possible Call of Duty would not have been on the PlayStation. So the risk was too great for them to roll the dice. Um, given that the their opposition in U.S. courts, at least, wasn't going to go forward. Yeah, and that's I, I don't know that that's a net win or positive. I'm not sure yet. Um, I don't as we're going to talk about in our main topic. I really don't trust the corporations at all. So <laughs> they they do not have our best interest in mind, nor do they care uh, about the games. It's, it is about money. And so. I think it's it's it'll be good for Call of Duty to be on all of those platforms. Um, I think Microsoft won that round for sure. Um, but um, 
all things considered, um, there's still a lot of good things to play and a lot of good games. And I think that's, it's, it's good for gamers that, that that's going to be cross platform, at least for the ne- foreseeable future, the next two generations anyway. So. Yeah, I think ac- more access is always better than less access. And I also think that with the increased price point, in order to have population density in any one game, they have to do cross-platform now because, you know, 70 quid as a starting price is a lot of money. So people are going to really start thinking about what they're spending their cash on. You know, for right. example, you know, we have only in this household purchased a single copy of Diablo, despite having two different systems that could play it and wanting to be able to play it together. It's just so expensive. It's, it, is it going to be fun enough to rationalize that? Probably not. So right. uh, instead, we just take turns hogging the PlayStation for about four hours at a time. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. So, <clears throat> so yeah. Um, oh, did you have any other news? Nope. That was it for me. That was it. I, I stole it. Okay, good. Um, well, so our main topic that we, I wanted to discuss, and this is something that, that kind of came across my, uh, radar just recently was this idea that, that, uh, archiving or the history of video games is sort of in at risk, like just the, the idea. And we, we kind of move along and, and, uh, maybe you don't think about it. And some gamers are just coming into this, this particular generation and aren't necessarily aware of some of the OG games out there. Um, a lot of the analog stuff because nowadays streaming or well, streaming is not really mainstream yet, but definitely digital downloads and the digital marketplace is, is really the, um, the first, I guess the first bastion for most people to go get their games. I mean, that's, that's kind of become standard, uh, and the brick and mortar stores, uh, the game stops, the, the replays or, or the other game stores that that sell hard copies are dinosaurs. They're they're becoming extinct, you know. Um, and I and I think that this is um, I think this is a problem. You know, personally, I think it's a problem. And we've talked about this for years now on this show. That uh, you know that you and I both I think at one point or another were either complete complete opposition of one another, where you were one hundred percent of the digital and I was just, you know, get off my lawn. I want my, <laughs> my games, uh, hard copy, hard copy games. And, and mine was, mine was more of a principal thing, less of a preference thing because I cannot lie. The digital download is absolutely convenient. It is. There's no doubt about it. I don't have to leave my house. Now I do have to wait about four days to get to play this stupid game because that's how long it down takes to download. But, um, but even if you were to buy a game at the at the store, you're going to have to bring it home and download a patch. So it's not like you can play it right out of the box. It's not that way anymore, unless you're playing Nintendo. I know. I when I plugged in Pokemon, it played right away. I said, "Oh my goodness, wow!" Yes. <laughs> Isn't that? But that's but it, that's amazing to me, and it's amazing that some of those games too, like even Breath of the Wild or uh, Tears of the Kingdom, which just recently yeah. released. I want to say it's a, it's maybe a couple dozen gigs, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, and it will go directly on to the to the switch, and it will play immediately. And that's a big game. That game is huge. What is going on in some of these games that are sixty gigs and and just and still need extra patches? It, it's like it doesn't make any sense to me. And again, that's not my field of or of expertise. But um, so I guess I want to pose the question first. So, what are your thoughts on game preservation and kind of what your background and where do you think we are with it right now, or, or the importance of game preservation? Well, I think for a lot of people who didn't get to experience these these games the first time around, it's going to be really important. I think you and I benefit from living through the creation of video games TM, right? Like, I can't think of a single video game that has been released outside of my lifetime. Do you know? Like, I... 
I think all of them from Pong straight up have been accessible to me should I want to play it at one point. And that is not something that any of the young people, you know, the Zoomers, as it were, uh, any of them can say because uh, many games were already extinct by the time that they were old enough to pick up a controller. So I think for me, it's not an issue, right? Because I will play every game I'm interested in right away around launch or shortly after, as I always have done, right? But I can recognize that for people who aren't a play it once, never play it again, or who are much younger, they want the opportunity to experience those games. Like, you know, maybe they want to play the original Dragon Age before the fourth one comes out, or they want to experience the very first Zelda before they play Tears of the Kingdom or whatever. I understand how preservation is important for them. Now, there is a group of people like me who don't care. I, I personally, it isn't for me. I'll play the game once and I'll probably never play it again. And I'm fine with that. I have memories and that's good. But I also realize that it's a very unique position to be in, to have access to pretty much every game forever. Even with people the same age as us, because I've always lived in the Western world, nothing has really been censored either. So there's like several layers to um, game archive and preservation that's important for many people, just not me specifically, although I can see it. What about you? Right. So, and I absolutely, I can respect that. And I see that it is important to me. And I think that's the academic in me. It's also the, um, the nostalgia factor and, and probably the power of nostalgia for me as well. I've gone back and played those games and on the switch, uh, you know, you can go back if you've got the service, you can go, um, and sometimes you can go and access and stream those older games in 64 NES, Super NES. Um, I've gone back and played a lot of those games and, and um, most of them are not very fun. Uh, all things considered, you know, they're uh, Kid Icarus is, is incredibly challenging. Uh, ice, ice climbers is a challenging game and it's not necessarily as fun, but that's all we had back then. However, for the purposes of preservation, and seeing where we came from and, uh, you know, do all games need to be saved? I mean, these are these are questions that probably eventually need to be answered. But I find it interesting that a medium that is as young, uh, maybe not comparatively, but has been around at least has been around for multiple generations uh, of of humans. I mean, we've, it's been around for 60. See, when Pong came if, over 50 years. Over 50 years of, of, of actual gaming uh, history. And uh, a lot of which is without emulators or ROMs would be, is gone. You know, um, I find, I just find it interesting because uh, of all the different mediums, this is the only one that has been actively lobbied against. I think it's because of, and again, I, I don't have the evidence to back this up, but I'm also not in the boardrooms with, with the individuals who are making those what? decisions. You're not. Come I'm on. I'm not. They wouldn't let me in. I promise you, they don't want me in there. But for many reasons. I, plus, first of all, because I don't know what I'm talking about. But the the fact that uh, with with what it appears to be, anyways, is um, it's such a relatively new medium. Unlike books, you. And that, that's tried to be censored as well. I mean, there are books that are difficult to get because they have material in it that people don't want to get out necessarily, or they think that they need to protect you from and don't need for historical purposes. I don't know that that's necessarily the case for games. What I do think, though, is that this medium is relatively young enough that they can control it digitally at this point. Uh, they just don't have to give you access to it. And then what do you have to do? You have to go to them to get everything that you need. You can't get it anywhere else. Literally can't get it anywhere else. And not only do you have to get it from them, but you're going to have to pay through the nose for every component, that, whether it be your skins, whether it be monthly access, whether it be for downloadable content that should have been built into the game to begin with. You know, it, you are going to have to pay and go directly to the source for everything. And they're going to make sure that you can't get it anywhere else. 
So the completionist, Gerard uh, Khalil, who's the completionist, if anybody follows him or watches his videos, he did a video a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it, it may have been over a month now, where he went and bought every single digital version of any game that could be purchased on the on the Wii and the Wii U, I believe. So it was right before they shut down the Wii online store. That is the last place that you could actually download onto a hard drive a lot of these games that were available through Nintendo. You could actually buy them. Uh, and so he had thousands of dollars. I want to say it cost over $10,000 for all of these games for him to him to be able to download all these things. And so his his he was illustrating the point that these games are going away and he was working in conjunction with the preservation uh, the video game preservation society which is a group of uh, philanthropists who are trying to bring awareness to this. Uh, they've all they they've brought a lot of information to the table including the EAS the Entertainment Software Association who is responsible for there are there are governmental body that goes to our government proper in the United States to fight for the rights of video games and and uh, video game makers and 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 so on and so forth. And they have this organization that is supposed to represent video games in the United States has lobbied against preserving video games. So they are. They are purposefully impeding the process. And, and I just wonder, I wonder why, like, what's the upside? And the only thing I can think of, because you have people who are willing to do this for free, archive this stuff, you know, to find it for you uh, and to kind of keep track of it and to preserve it. And the only thing I can think of is that they want to make more money. Well, <laughs> they of course. Want to, they saw you know, what Skyrim did, sold you the same game six times on six different oh. consoles and said, yes, sir. <laughs> and all of them are broken. <laughs> all of them are broken. Like all of them have the same bugs. In them. Oh, yeah. They never fixed them. They just sold it to you again. No, in a different it's package just, on a different now it's on the Wii. Now it's on, or now it's on the, the uh, switch. So let's take, let's go back to Diablo four. Right. So, Rewind to Diablo three. Do you remember what the big the big stink was about Diablo three? And that was I do. It was the fact that it was always on internet. <laughs> it was always on the internet, and they and then they tried and then they they doubled down on that with this real auction house where they could make a cut of money for selling goods. Like you were going to be able to sell your your armor for real money. To be fair, they, I do wish that that had actually worked because that would have been awesome. If if everything's the same, right? If if like you were, if you had this, if if it was based off probability, and you got something that was absolutely rare, and you wanted to sell it, and somebody wanted to give you, if like if it was all in the up and up, I I get it, man. I get it. I don't care about the cosmetic stuff that way. I don't care as much, but I get it. But you know that's not the case. That would not be. That's not the reason that they put it in there. Uh, just like if you're playing Diablo Four right now, you'll see they're nerfing the the probability of certain armor sets. They've everything that they've done is to make things more difficult for you to get things to go through the game. Uh, you know the it has been built from the ground up as a live service. The whole the whole thing is built as a live service. I played. I played for probably, I might have played about 20 hours, 25 hours. Um, I built a druid. I really enjoyed, I enjoyed Diabloing, you know, basically you just, it's, it's just clicking and grinding and clicking and grinding and it's fun. It's cookie clicker is what it is. Um, but, but it's fun. You know, I enjoyed it until I got to a couple of the bosses. Now, one of the things about Diablo Four is you've got you've got this skill tree that you need a physics degree to understand. <laughs> but you've got this skill tree, and and I don't have the math wherewithal to be like, if I trade this for this and the percentage, then I'll have this much AOE and this over here. I I don't. So I built my character the way I think you fucking should, which is however I want to. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. But guess what? 
I built a useless character that no. cannot kill cannot kill one of the major bosses on the way. Are you uh, joking? No. Oh, no. No, I I, I put you can back for like no money, right? Like Well, I did and I started trying to to I tinkered with some other builds. I went online and I looked at some builds. It's like, so how should I be building my and I'm like Okay, one, maybe I'm not as good at Diablo as I thought I was, but I mean, how hard do you have to be? I mean, how how good do you have to be and how hard is it? I even lowered the difficulty and got my ass handed to me. And and I was like, I and know. this is by, I want to say it was one of the first bosses uh, where Lilith. Um, Spoilers. It wasn't her, but it was like one of the first bosses that you go into. And and like obviously you can go in any direction at any in any order you want to. So I just followed one thread, mm-hmm. got my butt handed to me there. I said, okay, well, let me go grind some more. Maybe I need to improve my skills. And then I found another boss. Noob, noob, had to had died died there about 15 times and turned around no. and came back. Oh, wow. And so I found that like there are just like in Warcraft, there are very specific builds that you need to do if you want to maximize DPS, right? You want to maximize your ability to, or they want to make sure that you're playing with somebody else and you're mm. not trying to solo the whole game. It's the only two things that I could think of because I definitely wasn't going to believe that I'm that bad at this game. There's just no I way. I mean, I'm I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. But my bone boy's necro build is absolutely. But see, that's amazing. I've heard that the necro is is op, like completely. Oh my OP. god, it's disgusting. I and don't even play it like they recommend. I play it how I want to play it. That's what I'm saying. Like I. I I know I'm playing the way I want to play it, and and uh, I'm I'm a wear bear that that basically if you're in my AOE then you're good. But and I and I I wreck everything in and I was wrecking everything in the game. I had no problem. I wasn't dying anywhere but the bosses, mm-hmm. and I couldn't even get to the third the third phase of a lot of those bosses. I'd be like, no, no, I can't. I don't oh, know what wow. I'm doing wrong. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And if I ever had anybody that was helping me, like a, an NPC that was helping me, just worthless. They're just worthless. Oh, yeah, they, no. they're, they're, they're not helping you at all. Um, and so anyway, I say that because e- even in my extreme circumstances, which a lot of it is probably user error. It's my fault. Um, but it illustrates to me the level of which that they they are emphasizing they're saying it's social it's not social they need more people for more money it's not social because they're trying to build social networks it's social because they need more people online for a live service not yeah, because they're doing it for you that it's it's not that social so uh okay clarification so i'm on the nightmare tier like world 3 right 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 i'm level i'm nearly level 60 I do like Helltide, Nightmare Dungeons, like Whispering Tree. I do it all, World Bosses, whatever. I The character has probably only died 15 times total, Yeah, maybe. Um, and it's because I didn't do what everyone suggested and I kept my Bone Boys, not because they do tons of DPS, but they pull aggro off of me. So right. when things are recharging it is easier for me to kite around and still be doing damage. Obviously when they die, like if they go down, then I really struggle. Or if I've got no like ultimate or no crowd control up, then I'll really struggle. But I've got like an absolutely killer crowd control that sucks everyone into one spot. And then I explode corpses like a hundred times on top of it. And if that doesn't work, then I do my bone storm. The bone boys are just there to drag, like to get the DPS off of me. Right. Cause I, I'm, I don't have tons of health, but I've got like all these items that cast up barriers and fortify me and stuff like that. So I very rarely take too much damage in one go that I can't mitigate with like a potion here or two. But right. now that I'm in the end game, like aside from occasionally seeing other people doing the same event or like occasionally running into other people in the hell tide event, I even went to the PVP section, couldn't figure out how to kill someone else. We just were <laughs> killing NPCs in the same general area. I did a right. world boss. I died once in the world boss, but once I figured out what he did, cause I'd never met him before. Once I figured out what he did, it was nothing like it, it right. was fine. Um, 
three chests or something dropped on that. That was sickening, like from a loot perspective. But then I haven't seen another world event since. I've seen one world boss and I've been playing for like a week. Yeah. There's just not enough social content, if you ask me. Like, there's not enough. And, because and I you, wonder why hmm? that is. I, well, I just I wonder why that is. Uh, you know, why is it? Is it again like? Are they drip feeding it? Are they? You know, are they? What are they trying? Are they trying to keep you playing? I now I'm. I don't have. I don't believe that anything they do is in our best interest. So I'm just throwing that out there. Like they're. They're not not doing something because they've got it in the pipe because they, they just it's not quite ready yet. No, they're they're either holding stuff back or, you know, I, I have no faith. There is no good faith left. Um, but I go in skeptical, even with a game like this. I was like, you know what? I've really wanted to play Diablo and I liked Diablo three a lot, but I was able to breeze through even on one of the hardest difficulties I was able to breeze through Um with uh with Diablo 3 every one of the every one of the DLCs I, I bought everything and on this one it just the the difficulty spiked so much on uh on the bosses compared to your you know the 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 trash mobs and everything else that was in the game that uh I just didn't understand it's like I, this can't this can't be right there's something about the mechanics is all of the classes are not created equal. That's just. Oh, hundred percent. So. I think, I think with your Druid, if you're struggling in bosses, then you probably don't have enough defense and single target damage. That's probably, you know, like that's probably where the weakness is. I would have a look at that and just see um, where it is. Because like, for example, in the, this is probably a deviation, but going into the necromancer, a lot of people will take like blood spirit and like blood orbs and stuff. I didn't do that at all because I am not going to hide from the damage, right? I'm just going to kite around and try to avoid it. And I need to be strong enough to just take it because I know how I play, right? I'm not going to remember to trigger my little to miss so that I can't be touched for a few seconds and stuff. Although all of the guides will recommend that you take that. I just don't. And like, I think about like a specific way to throw down all of the moves like in order. And that makes the most like DPS. If you don't do it in order though, it's, it's slow and painful. So maybe it's worth looking at. Cause I find that the bosses, um, I have bone spear for bosses and it does really high ricocheting, um, single target damage. It's the only reason I have that skill is for the bosses. Cause otherwise I don't do enough, but I never need to use it for mobs. Yeah. So I just don't feel how, I don't think companies are doing any of this for anyone, any one of us. They're not doing it for the consumers. They're only doing it for themselves. This is to make money. Um, it's not to create social, uh, social platforms or a game where uh, being social is the emphasis it is meant to keep you engaged as much as possible with as little as possible uh, for as long as possible. <laughs> I don't. Well, I have to say, like the in-game content is pretty empty. I was expecting a lot more world bosses. I've seen one in five days. So yeah, and so and, and but you know the the story was good. Uh, you know the I've I've heard the complaints that the cutscenes are absolutely hit or miss in terms of. The quality, like sometimes the quality is good. Sometimes the quality is like uh, not even the same graphic engine, it seems like, you know. Oh, 100%. If I've got a top-down graphical cutscene, I skip it. I can't be bothered. Like, no, they're yeah. too, too long and it's too bad looking. Yeah. It, well, even but the close-up ones are are sometimes like, but the voice acting's on point. Like, everything is done well. Like, voice acting is fantastic. Lots of and voice acting. the story was lots. good, you know. Yeah. I, I found the story engaging, but... There, aside from the grind TM, there is not much to do, you know, other than just become level 100. And someone said that at 92, you are halfway to level 100. 
that doesn't even make sense unless the that's yeah, that the just, scale of how many XP points you actually need. That's what I'm level. saying. Unless the XP is so exponentially greater at that point, which to me also doesn't mathematically seem to scale properly. That that just doesn't seem to make sense. Eight levels to the end, then it just ramps up ridiculously. Like that, it doesn't make any sense. You know, so so to kind of bring it full circle to the to archiving and the history of games and the need for, for at the very least preserving the history. Um, I think it's, I think it's important. Uh, this is more of a soapbox than it is anything else, but I do think that there's enough evidence to support um, knowing where we came from the, the emphasis on, you know, the, the tangible hard uh, hardware, you know, where you actually have cartridges and discs and things like that. Um, having that preserved to remind us of what's important in the future so that we're we're not forced to forget that there was a time when everything that you needed was literally on the cartridge, <laughs> that you didn't need anything else, uh, that that is possible to, to, to ship a game complete that that's done that doesn't require not only patches but has you know paywalled content that is on the disc but you can't access without a particular code because they need to partition this game out into pieces uh just to make as much money as they possibly can um you know there are a lot of lessons i think we could learn from the past that i think would inform better business practices uh you know, we, we still have issues with with uh, crunch. We still have issues with other other uh, in, in the game industry and in game game production is in general. But I think there are lessons to, to be learned from archiving our history of games, uh, not just from the nostalgia factor, but from the production factor, from uh, quality uh, and and the emphasis on what makes games fun, you know, Um we talked a little bit of, and replayability can be something that we talk about in the future, but just, you know, the, what makes a game fun and, and makes you want to come back and play it or, or, uh, you know, that you might want to just, what's the fuss about, you know, on this particular game or on being able to go back and not having to break the law <laughs> to find out what exactly that means or, or, you know, where to go to find something like that, that it may, it may not even be possible. And that just shouldn't be so like that shouldn't, that shouldn't be a thing we have to be concerned at that. You can't even, you couldn't access that if you wanted to. And that is the, the direction that it's going, you know? So I think that's bad. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, I think that's bad. I mean, I will probably never take advantage of any archive services, but I also think that it's bad, especially from a creative and education standpoint. Like I benefited a lot from the creative commons and just things being out of copyright because they were old as I was growing up and learning how to write, which I do for a career now and, and stuff like that. And I think without access to that sort of stuff where people can experience it, you know, just like they can with old books or Handel's Messiah, you know, like it's important to have access to art that inspires you as well. And after a certain point, these, you know, these games are not commercially viable anymore anyway. So why can't they be made available as a cultural um, phenomenon? I think, you know, th there's no reason not to. And I, I see a lot of examples of how it's helpful in the past. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to do it because let's be honest, the Beatles are still selling their greatest hits for full price, you know? So, um, you know, not everybody ascribes to the philosophy, but I think that if anyone was going to do it, you know, probably one of the major studios will start to take archiving fairly seriously, you know, because I think they'll realize that that's where good design talent comes from is exposure to right. more content. No, that's that's true. The bigger the bigger companies are going to drag their feet. I 100 percent believe that they are right now. The smaller companies, the indie de developers are trying to do what they can to create 
an archive system of their games. You know, one of the biggest misconceptions, and this is sort of, you know, the direction and where we kind of start wrapping this up, but one of the biggest misconceptions is that having these games, having access to these games is going to affect future game sales. And that that is absurd. Um, I mean, you just said, uh, you said it yourself that these are not uh, financially uh these 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 games not only won't break the bank for us, they're not going to make a big difference, a drop in the bucket to some of these corporations. They're nothing. And so how, giving access to them, what does it cost you to provide a ROM or to provide the access to to that and sell it one time to a person, you know, because it degrades over time. There's there there is no reason. And, and they were using the EAS was using, uh, you know, the the example of libraries. Um, although that actually flies in the face of exactly what they're arguing for. Have, li- have libraries destroyed book sales? And the truth of the matter is no, no, not, not only have they not destroyed book sales, but book sales are thriving as much as they ever have. If anything, yeah. audiobooks might be a bigger knock against books than libraries ever will be, you know? But I get Which to is keep true. that Imagine libraries audiobook. being a problem. <laughs> What's that? I said, imagine libraries being a problem. I just can't even participate with well, that. Well, and argument. because That's you can rent, movie. you can rent movies there, and you can rent books, and yeah, you bring absolutely. them back, and and so you know, it's like that. That doesn't make sense. So that that dog doesn't hunt, as they say in the South. That dog don't <laughs> hunt. So dog why dog hunt. why you're doing this? Uh, that that particular line of thought doesn't doesn't seem to make sense so there there isn't necessarily a good reason not to do it outside of greed that is the only reason why i could see you wouldn't want to provide a service where people could rent games maybe the library is the answer where you could rent games or go to play them if you wanted to and and have have access to some of the you know and that way they could be curated or they, you know, and they could be taken care of so that, you know, people would destroy them if you were able to take them home. They're too fragile for that. But if you had a place where you could experience them, uh, where everybody could experience them, I think that that would be, that might be the answer ultimately, um, mm-hmm. universally accepted by everybody, you know, because uh, ideally, I think if you wanted to purchase it and have it forever, then you ought to be able to do that. They've done it with music. If you have noticed over the last, 10 years, it is more difficult to purchase music. You can rent music. You can rent services that will allow you to select any song you want at any time until you stop paying for the service. Then you can. (laughs) And then they've never heard of you. (laughs) Then they've never heard of you. Yeah. You'll never be able to get it. You'll never be able to buy the music. And and there just aren't as many platforms. And so I do think that's the direction it's going. But I think bringing awareness to the topic is important because Mm -hmm. then you'll have more people discussing it. It'll be in the zeitgeist. And then at that point, people who have the means might be able to step in and assist and, and help preserve games for the future. Excellent. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That wraps up this episode of Retro Rebel. I wasn't sure if it did, but it does. I want to thank Amanda for this week's discussion. All the notes from this week's episode will be posted on our site, templeofgeek.com. If you'd like to add to the discussion or reach out with questions, sound off in the comments or message us on Facebook or Instagram at Retro Rebel Podcast. And please head over to wherever you get your podcasts and rate us because that really helps our show. Until the next time. See you later.